Hello, and welcome to Burning Issues, the only program that provides you with a regular glimpse inside the Wichita Fire Department. I'm Captain Stacy Westby, and in this episode, we'll talk about the various functions and duties of fire crews during an actual firefighting incident. Our guests today are Captain Jeff Taves and Mike Russell with the Wichita Fire Department. Thanks, guys, for joining us today. Captain Taves, could you please tell us about the various functions that are needed during a house fire or a building fire? Sure. At any scene of a building fire or a house fire, we have our basic functions. We have fire attack, search and rescue, water supply, RIC, command, and ventilation. Those are the basic functions that we have. Now to break those down a little bit, fire attack are the crews that actually go in and fight the fire, put the fire out. Search and rescue are the crews that go in and look for victims, and if they find one, they'll go ahead and pull them out and address it at that point, whatever medical needs they have. Water supply are the crews that will hook up to the fire hydrant, bring a hose into the, to the scene, and supply the engine that's pumping the fire with water. RIC is a, crew, is, is a crew that actually protects our own. They will stay outside, be ready at any time to go in, and if we have any kind of trouble inside, uh, if the building collapses, or if a firefighter goes down for exhaustion, or for whatever reason, a crew will come in and be a rescue for our own. Uh, command is the function we'll probably get into a little bit more later in greater detail, but that's, that's the individual that's, that's running the scene, is in control and, and lets everybody know what's going on. And ventilation is, is a very important crew that actually comes in and will cut open a portion of the building or house and let the hot gases and smoke escape. Captain Russell, how many fire apparatus or stations respond to a building fire and do they come from different stations or do they all come from the same station? Well, for a minimum response for a house fire, we have three fire engines, two squads as with our smaller pickup style trucks, um, a battalion chief and one truck company, actually two battalion chiefs and a truck company. Uh, the reason we need so many apparatus is uh, due to our staffing levels and the way we staff our, our fire engines here in Wichita. It takes that many to get the needed number of personnel uh, to the scene. The NFPA, uh, which is an organization, National Fire Protection Association, uh, ha establishes codes or standards that are nationwide standards uh, to help fire departments uh, design their response to different types of calls. And their code in the NFPA 1710 recommends 15 to 17 personnel on scene of a of a house fire, and you have to have those people there during the first uh, 10 minutes or so of the of the operation. That's the most critical time. Uh, so we we gear everything around our response and trying to get that minimum of 16 people there uh, is what we shoot for. 16 with the amount of apparatus we have coming, we have 16 people on scene early on into the fire, which allows us to rapidly start some of the functions that Captain Taves was talking about. Some of the Crucial things, obviously fire attack and search and rescue are very high on our priority uh, to bring the fire under control to protect the, the people inside uh, and the property. Search and rescue, it, all, everything we do is centered around an aggressive uh, primary search, which is the initial search and rescue crew to make sure that there's nobody inside that's gonna be injured or killed because of the fire. Uh, so, so in order to get that number of people there to safely operate, uh, with that in mind, it does take three fire engines, two squads, uh, an aerial truck, and two battalion chiefs. We send two battalion chiefs uh, because one, the first battalion chief will act as an overall incident commander and the second battalion chief to arrive uh, serves as our safety officer, uh, monitoring the entire fire ground uh, and watching for safety concerns and, and the uh, physical well-being of our firefighters. Now most fire stations in town have uh, either two apparatus assigned to them or we have a number of stations that only have one apparatus. So obviously we pull from several stations for one house fire, usually a minimum of three stations in one area will converge uh, together to get those number of apparatus and people there uh, for those first few minutes of the fire to get things going. Captain Taves, he, Captain Russell had mentioned 16 people is what we try to get there as soon as we can. Is 16 important? Oh, in very your important. opinion, is, is that necessary? Uh, by all means, it's necessary. Uh, if you ask any, any crew member that's on the scene of a fire, that's probably not enough as far as they're concerned. 
the, re the reason we need so many people there, or it appears like we need so many people there, is as Captain Russell alluded to, most of our responses deal with an aggressive, fast attack. Um, very high stress on the body. Um, you're, you're going from doing work at the station, which is a, a low impact, resting heart rate scenario to a adrenaline rush, high impact scenario with a house fire. We get there, the adrenaline's pumping. We're behind the eight ball anyway, because normally it takes us anywhere from three to four minutes response time to get there from the time we get the call. So the, the fire's already had a chance to accelerate, get bigger. So we've got to go in real quick and get things done. So we're under physical stress to start with. We won't go in by ourselves because it, it's a very dangerous situation. Most of the time, the heat in the house by, the, by itself will be anywhere from 500 to 1,000 degrees, which is quite a bit hotter than a normal oven temperature. Um, besides that, there's, there's the issue of smoke visi visibility. Most of the time, we can't see this far in front of our face. Uh, very dangerous situation, so we're not going to go in by ourselves. Just in case we get in trouble, uh, our partners can help us out. Um, so in that situation, we, we always go in with a minimum of two on our team, hopefully three or four, um, to, to help alleviate the, the already stressful situation. Our gear that we wear is 70 to 80 pounds on top of our own body weight, um, again, which adds stress to our body. Um, and, and as I alluded to in the first question, we have different different functions that have to be done within five to ten minutes of arriving on the scene or we've lost the situation and uh, our job will be done at that point. Captain Russell, I've noticed a lot of times after fires on the news, you see firefighters standing around in the front yard. Can you explain why? What are they doing at that time? Yeah, you know, and oftentimes you'll see uh, firefighters standing in the yard after the fire, but uh, anybody who's had a fire in their neighborhood would probably say there's firefighters standing in the yard uh, during the fire. And it, it probably does appear that way uh, to the public. Uh, because of all these different functions that he talked about, and particularly the RIC crew, which is our rapid intervention crew, uh, that's in a ready mode, fully equipped to go in and rescue firefighters in the event of an emergency inside the fire building. Uh, so it may appear that those people are just standing around doing nothing, but they actually do have a, a purpose, and they're there in ready mode. And other crews might be standing by uh, waiting to relieve a crew uh, on the interior. Uh, Captain Taves has talked about the intense heat inside of uh, fires and the amount of physical stress that our bodies go through during those times. So we need to be able to rotate crews out pretty quickly. So. Instead of uh, having them sit in their truck sometimes and wait, we'll go ahead and have them move up uh, into a ready position, ready to relieve the crews that are doing all the hard work. So during the fire, when we see crews standing in the yard, uh, they, they actually do have a function. Uh, there's a reason they're there. There's, there's things happening on the interior of the building that you can't see from the outside. Um, so I've had people come up to me at, at fires upset and say, why are you guys just standing here? The fire is inside and I can see it coming out that window. Yeah, we're aware of that. We have a crew inside addressing that right now and, and we have a different job to do right now. As far as after the fire, uh, you'll see uh, on the news a lot of times firefighters standing around, have their coats off and they're drinking water. Well, that's all part of our rehab procedures. Uh, every time we come out of a fire, uh, we check on each other. Sometimes it's an informal uh, rehab where we um, <clears throat> just see how everybody's doing. Make sure we get some water and rehydrate. For longer duration or more complex uh, incidents, we'll have a formal rehabilitation set up for the firefighters where uh, we have a, a designated crew that comes and um, monitors our vital signs and uh, they, can, they have all of the capabilities that uh, Sedgwick County EMS, EMS would have. Uh, as far as monitoring our heart rates and things like that. Uh, so some of those uh, after the fire things that you see where people are, st are that appear to be standing around doing nothing, uh, some of them are in rehab, rehydrating, cooling down, resting up, you know, recovering from what they've just experienced. And uh, also and during that time and even after we have gone through the rehab process, oftentimes we're on scene waiting uh, while the fire investigation unit comes in and starts to try to uh, find out 
what the cause or the origin of the fire was. And uh, we, don't, we don't necessarily send everybody back to the fire stations during those times. We wait because there are times that uh, we have hot spots that start to smolder or other things like that, and we need to be there to protect the fire investigators as they do their job as well. So those are uh, a few of the reasons why you might see what appears to be groups of firefighters standing around. One thing I'll also add to what Captain Russell just said, um, our, our attacks are very coordinated. Um, the, the functions that I said, stated in the first question are not all done at once. We have, as I said, we have somebody in charge, somebody's in command, and they will coordinate each attack as it needs to happen. We won't send a whole bunch of crews in until we actually find a seat of the fire, where the fire's at. Once we find out where the fire's at, we'll then start searching for victims, not necessarily right at the fire, but as close to it as we safely can, and, and looking at whether they're gonna be, their chances of survivorship. Um, so, again, it looks like sometimes Crews are standing out with, with nothing to do, but it's actually a coordinated attack. We're waiting, we're waiting for the right time to go into the, uh, for our, our function to be done. Captain, Taves, Captain Russell emphasized rehab, and I know you're, you're affiliated with the rehab program pretty extensively. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me why is rehab so important for firefighters? A lot of studies have been done in the, in the recent history about the effects of, of the high stress, the high heat, the high energy level, the high adrenaline on, on firefighters, and what they're finding out is, is if there is an adverse effect to something like that, they're not going to find out right away um, because of the adrenaline, the firefighters are going to feel okay, even though they might have something going on. And, and what they found out through the studies are, are firefighters have died up to 24 hours after the incident because they're coming down off the adrenaline high and then, then the event that's happening to their body is kicking in. Um, what we're trying to do with the rehab program is address that earlier. We're, we set them down, take vital signs. Um, there's, there's normal limits and then outside of the normal limits. And if, if a firefighter is anywhere outside of the normal limits, we'll keep them there, um, calm them down, slow them down, get, get their vital signs back to within those limits before we release them back to the scene. And if they don't come down, we'll go ahead and transport them to the hospital. And what they've found out with a program like this, we're actually saving quite a few of firefighters' lives and the health, their health uh, for the future so they can not only be uh, functional for the job, they can be functional for their families and go home at night. So I take it maybe illness is a problem as a result of firefighters. Is that heart disease, heart attacks? Heart disease is a big one. Um, there, there are studies that say heart disease is the number one to killer, number two killer. Um, it, it's, as I've, as I've said several times, it's a very, it, you go from a resting heart rate to a adrenaline induced heart rate pretty quick. Uh, the body's just not made to, to withstand that quite a bit. So we're doing everything we can to minimize the, the effects on the human body. Captain Russell, at the fire, you mentioned uh, the incident commander. Uh, what is his function, and is he in charge of the scene? And if not, who is? How does everyone know what to do? Yeah, uh, initially, when the uh, apparatus start to arrive, it's, uh, it's uncommon for the battalion chief to arrive at the same time as the first arriving units. So we have in place uh, a system uh, to where the usually the second arriving uh, company officer will assume the role of incident commander. Uh, an incident commander is part of a bigger system that the fire department here in Wichita has been using for many years, uh, the incident command system. Uh, it's widely used across the nation and all of our firefighters and company officers are trained in the use of the incident command system and how they fall into that. And basically it's just a system of managing the emergency scene. Accountability uh, and knowing uh, who's doing what and where they are in case there's an emergency and so that you can uh, provide these coordinated attacks and functions that, that are taking place that Captain Taves talked about. So uh, typically, typically a response would go something like this. The first two units arrive. The first unit will uh, go into either an investigative mode if there's nothing obvious uh, from the outside or if there is fire or smoke showing they'll go straight into a fire attack mode where they're going to pull the hoses off the truck and they're going to have all their gear on, their air packs, and make entry to go in and start to search for the seat of the fire. The second arriving unit 
uh, serves as an initial RIC. They, we, have, we have a two in, two out policy. If we have two firefighters in, we should have two firefighters on the outside uh, to, to rescue those if they need help. Uh, so the, the second arriving unit will serve two purposes, the initial RIC and the company officer on that unit will assume a command role uh, so that he can start to formulate an action plan and as uh, more units start to arrive, he can start to plug them into the instant command system uh, wherever he sees that he needs whatever function is the priority at that moment, whether it be rescue or if it's uh, preventing the fire from spreading to the house next door. Sometimes we have to address that. There's different things that become priorities in different, in different cases. Um, then once the battalion, the first battalion chief arrives, then typically he will uh, relieve that company officer of the command role. He'll assume it himself and that company officer will then join up with his crew and join in the efforts to bring the, the fire under control. Or sometimes the uh, battalion chief will, will keep that company officer with them to serve as an aide because there's a lot of stuff going on in multiple channels on the, the uh, radio to monitor and things like that. Um, so we have, we have established functions and, and Captain Taves has talked pretty extensively about what those functions are and all of our crews and all of our firehouses understand every one of those functions and are trained to complete any one of those that they're assigned to. Uh, so that the instant commander will uh, delegate those assignments to each crew as they arrive based on his priorities and his action plan. And so they will know then what they need to do. Um, experience and training with our crews also helps um, our crews to prepare before they even arrive just by uh, having the experience of going to fires over and over and over you kind of start to, you know what needs to be done and usually in what order it needs to be done. So if I'm arriving on the second in fire engine, I know that most likely uh, my company is going to provide a water supply to the first fire engine which is pumping the uh, hoses that's going in to extinguish the fire. So we can kind of get our mind uh, set in that direction and do some things in advance on the way to the fire. Uh, like uh, we have computers in our fire engines that uh, have maps on them and locations of all the fire hydrants. So we can locate the nearest fire hydrant, alter our route if we need to, and we will stop short of the fire scene and stay by that fire hydrant. And uh, command will then tell us, okay, yeah, I need you to bring in a water supply. So we've already been, we've already prepared in advance because of the history and training, we know that that's what's going to be needed next. Captain Taves, it sounds like we use quite a few fire trucks, fire crews at a scene, and we've established that that's going to vacate several fire stations. Mm -hmm. What happens to the people in those neighborhoods that no longer have a, a uh, fire station that is staffed at that time so that they have protection while there's a fire going on a mile or two away? Right. We've, we've got a plan in place to take care of that, and it's, it's actually pretty seamless. Normally what happens, we'll vacate three stations in an area. Uh, when that happens, other crews are listening, and uh, normally orders from the chief will send them to fill in those stations that are empty. Uh, like, like Captain Russell said earlier, a lot of our stations have two units, two trucks in there. They will take one of those trucks move to a station that's empty and they will actually reside there until until the situation is over with and they can go back to their home station and that might be several hours four or five up to a whole shift depending on the the uh, complexity of the incident um, so what what they'll do is 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 actually move in or move up from one area to another um, and still leaving the coverage in the area that they came from because they have one unit now if that if that station is down to one unit they will go in farther and take a take a uh, unit away from that that station and keep filling in until we get everything covered it, it does limit our response but it doesn't alleviate it we still have response in every area and we will work back and forth with with Sedgwick County Fire Department and Wichita Fire Department worked out if, if the county is short we will send units out to them and vice versa if we're short in an area sometimes the county will send units into us so it it's it's beyond our own our own selves we work within the, ourselves in the county also Captain Russell, 
Captain Taves had mentioned, the, sometimes it, it's an extensive length of time that we're at the scene of a fire, and sometimes maybe even a 24-hour or longer period. Is that typical? Have you ever heard of that? And if it's not, what is a typical length of time that we have crews at a fire? Well, it's, it's, it's not typical for us to be there for 24 hours, but it does happen. Uh, you will usually see in a neighborhood that if you've uh, had a fire in your neighborhood and seen all of this unfold, uh, you'll notice after the fire is out and uh, the crews have been there uh, working to make sure there's nothing else going to burn, there's no hot spots, we'll a lot of times uh, bring a lot of uh, burnt items out into the front yard or into an outside area. Uh, it, just, it looks like a big pile of debris and that's basically what it is. It's fire debris from inside the structure and we do that uh, so that we can prevent any additional fires from from restarting from things that get left in there that are smoldering. So we, we're very thorough in checking for extension is what we call it where the fire extends from one area to another or into void spaces inside the walls or ceiling. So we have uh, uh, crews that will remain on scene for, for quite some time taking care of that function, that, that salvage and overhaul, trying to preserve as much property as we can uh, and take care of anything that could cause uh, an additional fire. Um, I also mentioned earlier the fire investigation unit. Uh, we'll have crews stand by on scene while they conduct their investigation. Uh, and then even when that's done, there are oftentimes you'll see one fire engine or a uh, squad uh, stay on scene for, for many hours or maybe even uh, a whole, a whole day, 24 hours. And, and what that usually is, is uh, one of two things. It's, it's we're holding the scene. It's, uh, we treat some of these fire scenes, if they're uh, determined to be arson or if they're questionable, we'll treat them as a crime scene. So we maintain a chain of custody with that scene. We keep fire department representatives on scene until the investigation is completely done so that nobody could come in and tamper with the scene and affect, you know, and, uh, affect the outcome of the investigation. Uh, another reason somebody might still be there is what we call a watch line. Uh, if we have a fire in a building or a house that we can't immediately access all of the void spaces and we can't uh, absolutely ensure that the, the fire is not going to restart somewhere else in that place, then we will leave somebody there to watch it. And we rotate crews in every couple of hours uh, and give the other crew a break and they can go back to their firehouse. But we will stay there and we'll monitor the situation as long as we need to until we can ensure that that fire is completely out and under control. Uh, you'll oftentimes, if there's uh, if the fire is either determined to be arson or if there's somebody that's been injured or uh, a fatality involved in that fire, we will have uh, dramatically longer scene times, maintaining custody and control of that scene while the investigation continues. Captain Taves, I've noticed on some fires that the firefighters have broke windows mm -hmm. and sometimes cut holes in the roofs of the building. Can you explain the, the necessity in that? Sure. Again, two or three fold on that, on that answer. The, the main thing is it's going to be for the safety of, of our own crew members. Like I said, the, the, heat, the heat in there in any normal house or, or uh, building fire is going to be anywhere from 500 to 1,000 degrees right off the bat. It could go up higher than that. Um, so, so we're under a high stress situation and as we all know, um, heat rises. So the reason for cutting a hole in the roof is to let that heat out. If we don't cut that hole, uh, the heat's going to go up to the ceiling and then bank back down or come back down upon us and we want to get that away as soon as we can. Also, um, it's a visibil visibility issue. The smoke is very dense. Um, it's going to be dark in there and we can't see anything. Uh, hence, if there's a hole in the floor, if it's burned through, or, or if there's something that, that we're not for sure about in the house, um, getting that visibility back, getting the smoke out of there as quick as possible is, is a safety issue for our crew members. Also, it increases the survivability of anybody that's actually in the house, a victim. If we can get that smoke and heat away from them um, as soon as we can, that, that's gonna up their chances of their survival. So we're gonna either break a window, which uh, will allow the smoke to get out quickly. Um, cutting a hole in the roof is a little bit longer, more in-depth um, 
situation, so it's going to take a little bit longer, but that's actually a, a, a better way of getting the smoke and heat out because it does go up. Um, it will actually cause a chimney and a draft, and just like a fireplace, it will actually vent the smoke out of the, out of the building. So that's, that's why it looks like we're causing damage, but we're actually saving the smoke damage to the house. We're saving a possible victim's life, and we're also saving the, uh, uh, it, it's a safety issue for the crew members that are in, in fighting the fire. Uh, oftentimes at fires, we see fire trucks parking. I, I've seen fire trucks drive past the house that's on fire, three or, three or four doors down, and park in front of the house down the block, and, and followed by other trucks that do that. Why? Why aren't they pulling up closer so they can get in there quicker and do their job? Well, there's, there's a couple of things that you're probably seeing. Um, one is when I talked about uh, staging or uh, parking at a fire hydrant that's nearby, uh, that's, that's, that staging is something that we do as a standard procedure. The, the initial arriving units will proceed immediately into the scene, uh, but everybody else that arrives after them we're, our policy is to stay uncommitted about a block away so that we have some uh, some flexibility in what we do. If we need to reposition our fire trucks or whatever we need to do, uh, we have that ability and we're not over committed into the scene until we've been given an assignment. The uh, first arriving fire engine, you might think that uh, we're missing the address or we've driven past the house that's on fire and it, and it just seems to be so obvious because the fire is coming out of the windows and there's smoke everywhere. Uh, it's actually our policy to drive past the house, or stop short, or drive past the house that's involved. And what that does is that allows room in the front of the house for our truck companies to come in. The truck company is the the big truck that we that you see around town with the huge aerial ladder on top of it, it has a, a big platform on the front that people uh, get inside of and operate and can raise that. Uh, but we've uh, we've allowed for access for them at the front of the house because they do have the specialized ventilation equipment that's that's crucial for um, the safety of potential occupants that have become victims in the fire or uh, to relieve the firefighters from the the smoke and heat stress that's going on inside there so we want to get that crew as close to the scene as possible and also it allows them to use their aerial ladder if they need to it gives them access uh, to the to the building better than if they were a few doors down. We have uh, we have lots of hose on our fire engines, and we can stretch hoses longer, but we can't stretch ladders. So that ladder on the truck is only going to be as long as it is, and you can't make it any longer. So we park them as close to the building as we can, and then we uh, have worked out systems to uh, be able to extend our fire hoses in a a longer distance and to do it really quickly and effectively. Captain Russell and Captain Taves, thank you for your time today for sharing this information with our viewers. And this concludes this episode of Burning Issues. Remember, Wichita firefighters are highly trained professionals who are your friends and neighbors. We are Wichita's bravest and we serve you 24 hours a day, every day.